On a brisk evening on the 12th of December 1978, in the outskirts of Salisbury, a small squad of insurgents set up a firing line of rocket-propelled grenades and machine guns. They fight for the end of white minority rule in their country of Rhodesia. Their target is an oil depot. It is the lifeblood of the economically isolated government that they are fighting against. Just hours before, they were given their powerful armaments by a shadowy representative from the Soviet Union. Firing on the squad leader's command, they launch their RPGs and send machine gun fire into the container tanks. As the oil burns, it symbolizes a clandestine victory for the Soviet Union in its world-spanning proxy war against the West. When you think about the influence of empires and nation-states on the continent of Africa, whilst the United Kingdom or France may come to mind first, in today's video we'll be asking the question, how much influence did the Soviet Union have in Africa throughout its existence? And what effect did it have on the continent in the modern context? Like any historical investigation, some background must first be provided. It would be during the closing phase of World War II when the Soviets first displayed interest in the continent, asking for joint administration with Britain over Italy's former colonies. The combined influence of France, the United Kingdom and particularly the United States however, who wanted to contain communism, blocked Stalin from getting an easy way into Africa. Despite this, the Soviet Union would find a less noticeable angle into Africa through the rising number of pan-African movements. They would be allowed to grow due to the post-war debt that Europe faced, as colonies simply became too hard to upkeep, it signalled the start of decolonisation. These African nationalist sentiments would come to a head at the Accra Conference in 1958. This fiery assembly of African states, led by Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of newly independent Ghana, affirmed their commitment to keep Africa out of European hands. Although it's important to remember that a lot of these pan-African movements were, as it suggests, nationalist, so like their discontent with the old colonialist powers, they too viewed the Soviet Union with suspicion. But this would not prevent future intervention from forces outside the continent. With Europe only recently divided between NATO and the Eastern Blocs, Africa was mostly untouched from the politics of the world stage. In 1961, first secretary of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, would make a speech pledging to support uprisings and liberation across Africa. Despite his fierce rhetoric, Soviet activities on the continent were up until this point limited in scale and impact. But there was no shortage of unstable African countries for the Soviets to try and gain influence in. From Angola to the Congo, and even so far as Morocco, the decolonization of Africa had made it an unstable region at best. The first major country the Soviets would set their eyes on was Algeria. The Algerian people were promised self-determination by France for fighting alongside the Allies during World War II, but went against their promise when the war was over. As early as May 1945, the native population were slowly preparing to overthrow the decades of imperialist rule that France had imposed on. United under the National Liberation Front, the revolutionaries boasted over 100,000 militants by 1954. France began a propaganda effort to stymie the growing discontent, but it was too late. Algiers, the capital of Algeria, became a contested battleground, filled with barricades, riots, and a large military presence. However, it would not be until 1958 when the Soviets would begin providing more than just words of support to the militants, sending a small amount of arms, supplies and materiel to sustain the FLN. This revolution was so violent that it was even a major factor during the collapse of the French Fourth Republic, causing Charles de Gaulle, who oversaw the restructuring of France, to eventually grant Algeria independence in 1962. Many French natives who lived in Algeria had the jobs that were essential for the management of the colony, and when there was an exodus following Algeria's independence, there was a brain drain for leadership and administration. Unlike other African states that would follow, 
Algeria's disdain for the West meant that they welcomed the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc with open arms, soon leading to various economic deals between Algeria and the Union, including the sale of gas and oil. Good relations between the Soviets and Algeria became the model for future expansion into Africa for years to come. A state similarly rich in mineral resources was the Congo, where in June 1960 gained its independence from Belgian administration. Within not even a week of Congolese independence, violence and the rising crime had swept across the Congo, in part due to the hasty evacuation of the Belgian colonial troops. Any form of central government in the state would collapse within a matter of months, with provinces like South Kasai and Katanga, both rich in ores and uranium, succeeding temporarily from the Congo state, which was loosely held together by Patrice Lumumba. Frustrated by his country collapsing around him, and his requests from the United Nations for personal aid rebuffed, he turned to the Soviet Union for support, who supplied him with a thousand military advisors, alongside a complement of weapons and material support. These resources would go to waste, however, when Lumumba was overthrown by the leader of his army, Joseph Mobutu, who forced the advisors to leave. The Soviets would be given another opportunity in 1963 to supply the Simba rebellion in the northeastern provinces of the Congo, through airlifting equipment to Sudan, who would in turn send it to the Simba rebels. Though this bloody rebellion would be defeated by Congolese forces and mercenaries led by Mad Mike Kuare, who signed up to fight for the Congolese, the collapse of the Simba rebellion secured Mobutu's regime and locked the Soviets out of the Congo for good. Yet some European nations were not as quick as Belgium to grant their colonies independence. Portugal, under the government of Antonio Salazar, resisted the tide of decolonization that had swept the world. It was no surprise then that by the 1960s they faced resistance from all their colonies. The first to fall into disarray was Guinea-Bissau, located in West Africa. In 1959, strikes led by the native Africans were brutally put down by Portuguese forces, now known as the Pijaguti Massacre, solidifying the image of Salazar as a dictator in the colony. This caused the main independence movement, the African Party for Independence of Guinea and Cap Verde, or PAIGC, run by Amilcar Cabral, to lead a guerrilla war against Portuguese authorities. Outside the capital of Bissau, the countryside quickly became bandit country, with rebels cutting down power lines and setting up weapon caches for future attacks. By 1965, the rebellion had reached all corners of the colony, and Portuguese opposition, initially just two infantry companies, had increased to several regiments accompanied by air support. The Soviet Union, noticing the increasingly volatile situation, offered the PAIGC a variety of APCs, anti-air guns and training programs, as well as old IL-14 planes for an air force. They even, in what was a major escalation in African affairs at the time, moored their own warships off the coast of Guinea to discourage the Portuguese Navy from launching air attacks on the mainland. By the late 1960s, the PAIGC became one of the most well-armed insurgencies of its time, mitigating Portuguese air superiority and control over the colony, forcing them to employ tactics such as napalm and Agent Orange, as seen in the later Vietnam War. In the end, Portuguese forces were mostly pushed out of the country until the end of Salazar's regime in 1974, where a peace agreement was reached. We can see then how this is the first conflict so far where the Soviets played a decisive outcome in helping an African insurgency throw off the grip of the European powers. Now with the Cold War in Africa heating up, the weapon of choice for an inspiring insurgency would be the ubiquitous AK-47, a gas-operated assault rifle made in vast quantities by the Soviet Union and her allies with rugged dependability, even if its owner did not care for its condition, it proved to be a defining image of revolution 
at a cheap price. On the other side of the continent, Portugal's colonies of Angola and Mozambique faced almost simultaneous uprisings like Guinea-Bissau. Angolan nationalism rose in the 1950s after Salazar's government encouraged another wave of white settlers to set up farms and livelihoods in the colonies. In response, Angolan nationalists set up the People's Movement for Liberation of Angola, or MPLA for short, a Marxist-Leninist movement heavily backed by the Soviets. Alternatively, there was the Union of the Peoples of Northern Angola, or UPA for short, with a much larger goal, to incorporate Angolan and Belgian Congo lands into forming the old Kingdom of Congo, dating back to the 1300s. In 1961, Angolan peasants working in cotton plantations would go on a strike, giving UPA forces, led by Holden Roberto, a reason to use his several thousand militants that had been building up in the Congo to launch an incursion into Portuguese Angola. Groups like the MPLA were kitted out by the Soviets with all you could need to launch a revolution, including Kalashnikovs, rocket-propelled grenades, and both personal and anti-tank mines. In return, however, the Soviets asked for rights to set up military bases in the country. By 1967, Portuguese control had been reduced to the coastlines and waterways of Angola. With more groups, such as the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, or UNITA, had been formed, with old ones, such as the UPA, being merged into the National Front for the Liberation of Angola, or the FNLA. By this point, even an expert in international affairs may be confused with all the faction acronyms. Angola had become a hotbed for international intervention, with the United States assisting Portugal and even South Africa and Rhodesia performing clandestine operations in the border regions. Ultimately, the Soviet-backed MPLA would manage to beat back the other rebel groups and continue to be heavily armed by the Soviets through Zambia and Tanzania. On the other side of Portugal's African holdings, Mozambique had undergone a similar road to independence. Instead of a multitude of parties that may have confused you at Angola, most agitators in Mozambique were aligned under the Mozambique Liberation Front, otherwise known as Freelimo, which formed from various smaller groups in 1962 under Eduardo Mondlé. Originally, Freelimo pleaded with the United Nations for support, but when Portugal threatened to withdraw their military from NATO, they would have only the Soviet Union to ask for support. By 1964, they felt ready to launch an insurrection against Portuguese forces. Within just a few years, Freelimo forces had much of North Mozambique under their grasp, mainly due to poor communication and a lack of military infrastructure for Portuguese forces. The Soviets, impressed by their progress, would send further aid, such as high-caliber and anti-aircraft guns. In the 1970s, both Angola and Mozambique would be considered highly valuable by the Soviet Union for the rise of communism. The leaders that made up the Free Lemo Command were mostly trained in Moscow as well, where they could be easily influenced and return home with Marxist ideals. Through this then, we can see how the Soviets were vital in keeping the rebellions in the Portuguese colonies equipped and well-led. Over in the state of Rhodesia, which had de facto declared independence from the United Kingdom in 1965 over refusal to accept a black majority rule, had the Soviet Union play a pivotal role in supplying the Zimbabwe African People's Union, headed by Joshua Nkomo. ZAPU was a socialist party and began to militarise after the arrest of their leaders. The second, more well-known party, the Zimbabwe African National Union, would be funded separately by Communist China. Heavily armed guerrillas from both parties would infiltrate themselves through the Rhodesian-Zambia border, setting up caches and bases in the sparsely populated bushland. Despite these efforts, the Rhodesian military was well trained and equipped, and would prevent them from gaining any major ground until the late 1970s, when their small force would be overwhelmed 
both Zapu and Zanu had returned in greater numbers. A great deal of the guerrillas were trained at camps from Pyongyang to Cuba, with Zapu even forming a more conventional army, with Soviet supplied armoured vehicles replacing their former guerrilla strategies. Advanced weaponry from the Soviets, such as SAM missiles, were also used to cripple Rhodesian air travel. Finally, their new tactics in sabotage and disruption taught by Soviet trainers meant Rhodesian security forces were left stunned and unable to adapt to the new guerrilla methods. The war would only end when pressure mounted from both the United States and South Africa to bring an end to the fighting, combined with the Rhodesian oil industry being destroyed in a Zafu attack, forced Rhodesia to end their white minority rule, with Robert Mugabe from the ZANU party becoming president of the newly named Zimbabwe. The Soviet Union during this war had an important role to play in arming Zappu insurgents with an assortment of weaponry, who contributed significantly alongside ZANU to bring down the Rhodesian government. But as seen in the Congo, this was all for naught as Mugabe consolidated his power and was against continuing relations with the Soviet Union. But their influence even extended to the Horn of Africa, where in the Ogaden War between Ethiopia and the new Somali Democratic Republic, which saw Somalia engage Ethiopian forces over the disputed Ogaden region in 1977. Even though both sides had Marxist leanings, the Soviets decided to aid the Ethiopians, who had taken a defensive posture to the Somali invasion, who were sending over 70,000 soldiers to occupy the region. Almost entirely supplying Ethiopia's equipment needs with firearms, armoured vehicles and aircraft, alongside direct military support from Cuba, this escalation of the Cold War resulted in Somali forces being crushed. By the turn of the 1980s, the Soviets would find themselves back in Angola in a civil war, supporting the MPLA like they did fighting against Portuguese colonialism. The Angolan Civil War was by far one of the bloodiest conflicts in Africa during the latter half of the 20th century, as well as the first major proxy war between the East and West. The MPLA were pitted against UNITA and the FNLA, nationalist groups fervently opposed to communism and supported by the United States. From 1981 onwards, the MPLA were delivered a vast amount of military support from BMP-1s to BM-21 rocket artillery, a huge upgrade from the guerrilla warfare that beset the country 20 years As Angola quickly became the next hotspot in the Cold War, US intelligence sources state that up to 10,000 Soviet soldiers from frontline to supporting roles were involved in the conflict. With the dawn of the 1990s, the effects of velvet and violent revolutions across the Eastern Bloc states made Soviet expansion into foreign lands an expensive affair, especially with the internal turmoil that Gorbachev's government had to deal with. Perestroika was the new order of the day, which reconfigured the Soviet economy with liberal economics. But we must now draw our attention back to the question at hand. What effect did the Soviet Union have overall on the African continent. Were they eventually successful, maybe in aiding rebellions with overthrowing the colonialist powers, but failing to set up a model African state that followed the communist ideology? It would also have been hard for the Soviets to help heal the wounds of racial and tribal division that resurfaced through decolonization. Though it would be hard to get a definitive answer in one video. Either way, we hope we gave you a good insight into the reality of Soviet efforts in Africa in our documentary. We hope you enjoyed and would like to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, make sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.